<clears throat> Will you bow with me, please? The fathers, we come to you today on oh, such a great day, beautiful day in which we can serve you. The life outside is very, very delicate. The influences are significantly toward the other side. The times we have here are significant for us in our walk with you. Thank you for the hugs that are so prevalent here, kind words and support, because that's where we're going to need that stability and strength to move forward. Be with us today and this time. <clears throat> Let us put away or aside all the other stuff that's going on in life and try to focus on how we can glorify you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A little pingy, isn't it? Right, let's try this. <clears throat> hey, Jimmy. I can shake your hand, too. <laughs> uh, last week, the week before last, we were up in Sholo and we came back on Friday. <laughs> we got in my colonoscopy pre exam was Monday morning, and we had two email messages or phone messages left on there. The first one said, You've got to fill out this form. If you don't fill out the form, you've got to be in trouble. Make sure the form is filled out. You've got an email that, that uh, has the attachment in it. Please call the office to confirm your meeting. We didn't get until Friday, so Wednesday that was there. Thursday, we get another email message or phone message saying the same thing. If you don't call, you know, basically you're going to be out, out of luck for your, your meeting, your appointment, but you've got to fill out this form. Form is going to be very important for you to get through. So we had those two voicemail messages. So I called right away, and he confirmed my date of birth. He confirmed my name so we could start talking. And he said, there's already been two emails sent to you with the information. And also this week, you'll probably get this weekend, you'll probably get a packet you need to fill out. Make sure you fill that out before you come in. I said, this is Friday. I have not received any emails from you, no documents whatsoever. What's going on? This is the process that we have now. So I read my email address, confirmed that. He also read my home email, home address. I confirmed that. Then all of a sudden he said, well, there's no cell phone number. I said, okay, let me give you the cell phone number. So I gave him Linda's cell phone number so he could call and have that on file. I said, that's good. But the question I've asked you from the beginning here, this is the third time, where's the email messages you sent, and where's the packet of information that I asked for? Here is his answer. Because there wasn't a cell phone in their files. Sometimes you just want to say, here's your sign, I'm going to send it to you, please give me your address. That cell phone had nothing to do with email or snail mail. We never got it, by the way. So I went one Monday and had to figure it out when I got there. Interesting aspect of living in life. So we're not going to be here next week. We'll be going to um, uh, Hawaii for one of my grad, my grad students' wedding there. So Steve is going to take over. And so Steve is going to be, uh, by the way, we know him as a second shift at them, is going to be taking over the class. And his is called the Lessons from today's Jerusalem. This is the third installment of that. I was there previ to the first two. Really good information, so I know you're going to be excited about that. Then the next quarter, because that would be my end of my quarter, the next quarter we see that Cub is going in. He's also known as short shift or cut. And he's going to be taking over and he's going to talk about Romans. So he'll start to cover the book of Romans. I don't know if he's going to get through all of Romans in uh, 12 weeks. That would be a hustle to get through that. That's a huge, huge book. But anyway, that's what's going to happen. So we're going moving in from this quarter into the uh, next quarter of this year. We used to have it on January through March. Now it's February through April. So anyway, let's get into this. This parable we have today is the last one we have in a series, and it is full of controversy. 
that we're going to try to get through that controversy. I have eight questions we're going to try to answer through this process, but the bottom line is, is it figurative or is it literal? I have heard members and preachers from the pulpit try to make this literal. It does not work. So we've got to look at it from that standpoint. So it is basically this definition. It is the cost of being a disciple. The whole parable is built upon this idea. Jesus is coming to the crowd and saying, if you're not willing to get full commitment, don't come at all. That's the focus of this parable. Any other way we look at it, we get into problems. And I'll deal with those problems we have in our brotherhood as well as on the outside as we go through. So let's read it and see what's going on. There's an introduction. There are three different segments going on. Some theologians believe there's at least two parables here, or quite possibly three. I believe it's one parable. You have three points bringing up that side. Now, large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate, we'll talk about that word in just a second, his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So he had a lot of people following him and why they were there, because it was a nice show. He was giving miracles, and he was also feeding them. But their commitment was not there. He's challenging them and saying, if your commitment is not here, move away and get away from me. Finishing that, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Here's an interesting point here, because this is well before Jesus went to the cross. Even his disciples didn't understand that idea of him going to the cross. It was the most humiliating, dehumanizing way to die that there has been in our existence. Those individuals knew of the cross and knew why, why those individuals went to the cross because of the worst punishment of their worst criminals. So Christ talking about that and him being the Messiah did not fit. So he throws this cross out and threw them also as well. But we'll talk about what that cross means. So let's get into the parable. Let's look at it from the three parts that I have here. I think it flows pretty well if we look at it from the three parts. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who are watching it will, become, will begin to ridicule him. Finishing that, saying this person began to build and was not able to finish. Start and compent and finish. So we'll, we'll have a time to look at that a little bit deeper. Second part, or the second side of this, or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to face the one coming with him with 20,000 men. Otherwise, while the other is still far away, he, the first king, sends a delegation and requests terms of peace. He ramps up in this parable the commitment and also the um, side effects. The third and last part is the one we have the most controversy with, and when you look at it from research-wise, oh, excuse me, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his possessions. We'll talk about that ramping up in just a moment. The last part. I have heard this, tried to shoehorn this in literally, and I, as a Christian sitting in the audience, never could figure out what was going on. It didn't fit. From my background and research, I'll try to give you a little better understanding of what this is all about. Therefore, salt is good, but even salt has become, if, has, but even if salt has become tasteless, what will it be seasoned? Ending. It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is to be thrown out. The key piece here, the one who has ears, let him hear. That does not mean this structure on the outside. It means the comprehending, the wanting to comprehend, the one that hears, let him hear. So we have introduction and we have three parts of this parable. Let's get into it a little bit. I mean, I want to pose the questions rhetorically and then see if I can answer them. And at the end of that, we'll have time for questions. Let's see if I can answer first. So the first question, what does it mean when Jesus says to hate your parents, your wife, your children, your siblings, even 
your own life. Step further. Is Jesus saying to treat your family members with disrespect? If that's the case, and it's literal, that means we have a problem in the Bible. So it can't be literal. So you can see the hyperbole starts here. The exaggeration goes all the way through this parable and ends. So let's look at Matthew 10, 37. Here's a companion verse that takes hate out but puts a different uh, context in it. Matthew 10, 37. The one who loves father and mother, what more than me? This is much more palatable and actually means about the same thing. Is not worthy of me, and the one who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In other words, what's he saying? This is a commitment. Don't let your family, we talked about that last week, your family can be the God in front of God. Well, my family wants me to be there. My family doesn't want to go to church because they're all from another denomination. They want me to go there, so I'm going to go there. That's the type of issue he's talking about here. And using this term hate, this term hate is a really interesting part because it's another hyperbole that he sends out. And so let's look at it from a Greek standpoint and then look at it from the standpoint. It is a shocking way to get the people to start listening. He has now got all these people around him and he's telling them, you're not right. If you're not going to be committed, get out of here. We're going to talk about 2 Peter 2, uh, 21 just a little bit. I never could understand that verse until I got started on this lesson that we're talking about today. So hating is not neutral. Hating is not just not being around somebody. Hating is not just disinterest. That Greek word hating means literally actively despising that person. That's a harsh term. Alien to what he talks about in humility and love. So let's look at it and say, it is a hyperbole. Let's look at what's going on here. So Jesus' intent by using this word and some of the other words in here was to challenge. He wanted to shock them into seeing something else is wrong and you've got to figure it out because you're not in a right stance. So this hyperbole is just an extension, overextension of a word to maximize the impact. That's why he's using these words. So Jesus is challenging us not only what we do, but how we think and how we respond to what his call is or what we used to, it was originally called the way. So what does Jesus mean by hating your closest family, friends, your loved ones, and your own life? He is contrasting our allegiance to the self-defined life that we had before we were Christians to what we're going to be when we are Christians. It is contrasting it in the, in the harshest terms possible to get people to think and say, this is another way I need to look at it. So in this context, we see originally it's family. So we have family that's going to be a God in front of God. Then we have possessions is the next part of this parable. That means everything we have, and there's an attachment onto that with the king, and that means even our own life. So we're going to ratchet this up as we go through. But it's basically looking at obedience, and are you obedient to, to uh, Christ and the message here? He is number one. There's no other number one. There's not a crowd at the top. There's number one, and everybody else is underneath that, and everything else is underneath that as well. It does not categorically excuse us from what we have as our family responsibilities, nor does that give us ownership to go and mistreat people either. That's not the context of this. Humility and love are still key in this process. So our responsibilities as a family member, and that means family member here because we're all family members, to help one another is still up at the top. It just means we have to prioritize our life. It's our choice to prioritize. If you prioritize your family, if you prioritize your possessions, you're wrong. The priority should be who's number one? Jesus, categorically. The rest falls out, but Jesus is the number one. So it gets kind of harsh when we say, well, our parents' wishes are not 
first. Now, we instill in our children that idea that our wishes are important because we have some insight and we have some history behind us. But this means if your parents come and says, no, we do not, they didn't tell you, you do not want to go to that church, you want to go to some other church, that's the point we stand up and say, no. Jesus comes first. We'll seek that first. If our spouse or our children or someone else, it's close to us in the family, also tries to ply us away, this is the point we say, no. Because the responsibility is Christ and what Christ has for us. So we finish this first part. Any questions you have or comments you'd have concerning this hyperbole, this issue about hating family and uh, self? Okay, got through that. I was thinking that you know we we clearly get the point that um, Jesus should be first, but I think if you look at it a little more deeply, um, our children, our parents, our all any of our family can hurt us to the point that we feel feelings and uh, emotions that we would never. It is interesting here, and this is an emotional piece. The rest is more literal, but this is an emotional piece. Because the guilt that we have, our family members can play upon us, really is troublesome. And so Jesus is coming back here and saying, I know this is going to happen, but the bottom line is, you have to put me up here. If you can't, then go ahead and go away. And there is something about life after this that should be a focus. Let me go ahead and just, I was going to do Second Peter 2, 21, a little later, but I, I like your point, and so you can segue into it. Remember Second uh, Peter 2, 21? It would be better for you if you never, what, follow the way, become the way of righteousness, and then follow away there. I always struggle with that verse. What does it mean? The people that... Our members that fall away and go to hell are going to the same place that the people that never associated with Christ. So what is that all about? You know, it's interesting because I was looking back at another parable that we'll do next year. Uh, it's a story or a parable about Lazarus and the rich man. The physical body is going to be burned up. But something about that cognitive side we see, and I'm, I don't have an answer for you, so I'm just throwing it out because I'm a question of myself. But that cognitive side seems to say, maybe stay consistent. Imagine how bad it would be if you were a Christian and you decided to fall away and then all of a sudden resurrection comes and you know where you're going. How bad would that be to know if I would have just turned around? All the advantages, all the opportunities, if I had just turned around, I wouldn't be going here. Have an existence forever, knowing that? I think Peter put it really well. Again, I don't have an answer for that verse, but it kind of makes sense now when I look at some of the other aspects. So I'm open. If you want to talk to me afterwards, that's fine, because I'm open. That, for me, hit finally home where, where Peter 2.21 was talking to me. So anyway, thank you very much for the comments. Second question. The second, third, fourth are similar, much like we had here. What does it mean to carry on cross? And remember, this is a situation where Jesus has only been telling his apostles and maybe some of the close disciples he's going to die. And for those people to associate cross with somebody like Christ that they thought was the Messiah or this learned individual was really alien because only the worst of criminals were put on the cross. So here's his audience. A bunch of people coming. Why? Because they want to be fed. He told them. I'm ready to feed you something else. Not with real food, but spiritual food. And they wanted to see the show, and they wanted to get clothed and, and fed. That's why they were there. He's challenging them at this point. Carry your cross means a significant change in what their life was of self-interest, and ours as well, self-directed life. The cross means death, giving ourselves up even to the point of death. So that physical, emotional even quite possibly the death we would have here is what needs to be put aside 
And all of that allegiance goes to God and said, if I have that, it is worth it. That's what he's bringing to him at this point. So this cross to them was a troubling issue. One even his apostles did not really grasp until after the cross. But he's bringing that point to them as strongly as he can with what's going on in the social strata at the time. It's not superficial. If you're going to be superficial, go home. Get out. It is not worth your time to be here unless you're going to be fully committed. So this commitment is all through this parable. We know that uh, Glenn had a great uh, last series a few weeks, months ago on the churches in, in uh, Asia Minor. And what did he say about Laodicea? I wish you were cold. I wish you were hot. But you're lukewarm. I will vomit you out of my mouth. Same here. Lukewarm doesn't fit. There's not a third possibility of being there or not being there or being lukewarm. It's only one or the other. I don't know about you, but how many of you like to drink lukewarm water? Cold water I could do. Hot water, no. But lukewarm, something about it. Now, my grandmother on the ranch, she loved lukewarm water. I never could palate it. But anyway, in this case, no, there's only two choices. Either with me or against me, one or the other. So we can see that this parable, and many of the, the theologians say it's two parts. I've broken it down into three. You can see them in your notes. They are listed here. That's what we've talked about before. So now we have the end of the second question. Any points of reference or things you might have for me at that point? Three and four slide together. So I want to bring them to you one at a time and then see how I ratchet it up a little bit. So if you're going to, let's put it into our context today, because we're not going to build towers. Anybody building a tower in your yard right now? Okay, I didn't want to put you aside here. So we have renovation projects. So we're going to renovate a bathroom. We're going to renovate our kitchen. We're going to renovate something. What do we do first? You call somebody that you think is an expert, that is going to give you a quote. Because obviously they come back and you have $10,000 and they say it's going to cost you $25,000. You're going to, whoa, can't do that. We want to find the cost. And you're right, Rusty, we want to go to somebody that can do it, but also we know they're going to be using the product we want in the process. So how do we make sure we know the costs? Now, Rusty just answered that and very well because you want people that know what's going on and also can do what they're going to be doing. What consequences do you see in this parable that can happen if a person does not, not able to finish? We can see that they're ridiculed. That's not a lot of fun. Anybody like being ridiculed? Uh, not on my list either. I'm going to have to take this off. We work on airmail. Okay, hand. I think I saw a hand before I started throwing things around. Okay, it's going on. So the ridicule is going to be there because the building is not being finished. But there's much more that can, can happen. If we start building and we tear up the ground and have a hole in the ground, what could happen is the, the city could come back and say, you know, that is a hazard and you need to fill it in. So that means you're spending more money that you don't have just to fill in what you just worked on. The point is, what Jesus is getting to here is, you want to look ahead, make sure you look ahead first before you make a commitment to see what is the needs, what do I need to do, and do I have the skills and the ability to do so? If not, don't do it. So if your Christian life is half built, we have the foundation started, we will walk away, we can see that's not going to get us anywhere. In fact, if that 2 Peter 2.21 lies here, it means it's even going to be worse for us to remember 
we could have been somewhere else the rest of our lives. So what are the costs he's talking about here? Now, we've used it in a sense of literal, but what are the costs? What are the costs to us? We already said that Jesus is the priority. He's number one. No one else is going to be up there at that top level. What are some of the other costs? You might lose your social status. I've had friends that lost their jobs because they're Christians. I had a job interview. I went to, I really needed the job, and I was uh, well suited for the position, and the individual on the other side knew I was a Christian. He lambasted Christianity all the way through the interview. I knew when I left that was not going to be a job for me, and I didn't want to be there anyway after meeting him. But there are issues in the social strata that we could also have cost. You have to give up your time. Because number one doesn't mean me anymore. Our money, instead of having all the money here and doing it, we are to give back. We help other people with that money, and definitely the church. Our careers might change, as we just talked about here. Those are costs. So we can either be hated to the point that some of the Christians outside of this area, this United States, are being killed, rounded up, and put in prison. I remember Carl Mitchell at. Uh, Pepperdine before he left and went to Harding. He and I were really good friends. I had several classes with him. And he talked about his imprisonment in Rome because he went there to be a missionary in Rome and he was put in prison for almost nine months or something. And he talked about being in prison and what that was like. It was totally alien to me. That you'd be thrown in prison because you're a Christian, you're, you're teaching in a Catholicism type government. So it doesn't mean, though, that once you're a Christian, all the troubles go away. In fact, they may multiply. Because now your focus is on something different than what everybody else around you is doing. But the problem Jesus is getting to here is don't start the attempt and turn around. Keep going. Find a way to build momentum in what you're doing. And that's what the whole point of the parable is. Don't become lukewarm. Don't let it impact you. So he said three and four work together because they're just a little bit on, on uh, one side, adding a little bit more to it. So how does this apply to the discipleship? Well, the cost means looking at it from a standpoint much deeper than we add normally. What interest do we have? If your interest is staying close to society, the answer is don't start it. If it's, I can give some of it, but not all of it, don't start it. That's what he's saying. Very harsh statement. In our society today, once you get somebody that's kind of interested, we want to nurture them along. Christ is saying, I already know what you're talking about and what you're thinking. If you can't make the change, get out. Very harsh. But obviously he had abilities we don't have to read minds. So don't attempt the journey. Go back home. Don't attempt the journey. So this commitment is not just a fleeting commitment. It's a significant commitment. And that's why I keep going back to this point and rehashing it, because that's what Jesus did all the way through this parable. So again, the bottom line is be very, very sure before you start it. Any questions now? Because three and four now we've gone through it. Yes, Gary. You're basically pointing out that Christianity is the concept of a process. You're going to have you're going to have drawbacks and you're going to have strong points in that process. And when you look at the things that are being presented here, in that process, some of us are going to have problems with our family. Some of us are going to have problems with the concept of building up our own uh, ability to withstand the influence that come into our life. But it's a process. It's a constant building up. And it's not something that just levels up. It is on a very Python scale. Um, not in layers, you're right. It, we see from the very beginning, we're going to talk about that in a couple of scriptures, when he call people, what they do. Uh, so we'll look at uh, several scriptures there. Bottom line is, it's getting in a rocket and taking off. Obviously we have that milk at the beginning and then the meat coming in later, but it is change everything you have in life and look at one focus. That's it. You go there. Not around it. You go there. So it's a significant change, you're right. Good point. Any other questions? I've been a member of Holy Church for many years, <laughs> and uh, I'm not the same person I was 20, 30, 40 years ago. I, I, I see a difference as I, you know, as I age, that I'm not the same person I was. So I, that's a good point. 
Yes, that's a point, and a very, very valid uh, uh, addition. <clears throat> the difficulty we have, and when I talk to Christians that have turned away, inevitably what I find part of that is they forget how much they had changed in the process. They lose fact of the momentum they've built already, almost to the point where they go and they have to be perfect to get there. They never can get there, so I go back. No, how far have you gone? Don't lose the fact of what you built up already because we're building on that, moving toward a site. It's like taking the first step. You don't go on vacation until you actually go. You can do the other things that we have. I talked about my students in ASU. I said, you're not on vacation until you leave. But when you leave, you're starting the vacation. But it's getting everything appropriate nature of what I need ready, and then I start. But that piece we built up can't be lost. If it is, we're going to turn back. So what were you last week? How much better are you this week than last week? And that's really what we need to do to keep the moment going. John. That's a sad experience. Um, I watched three elders' kids come to Pepperdine. <clears throat> I met them at a uh, three-day kind of get-together. No one gets annoying other, other, but it basically it was three days where we terrorized everybody else in the camp. Um, that was my group. But the bottom line is I watched those three elders' kids within two weeks turn away. It wasn't... I don't want to go into a great detail, but it was fascinating to watch what they switched, manipulated, accepted within two weeks of getting Pepperdine. It wasn't Pepperdine. It was fascinating watching them work. One of them was from Seattle, and, and uh, he and I talked quite a bit. Uh, he went to um, Germany and part of our extension class, never came back to Pepperdine. But anyway, it, it is interesting what's going on with the influence on the outside. Number five, so we're going to get five, and then uh, we'll see the real major controversies are going to come up in just a second. So this king going to war. Now we have gone, and we'll look at family, putting family in front of God. We've looked at the possessions and your own self-interest. Now we're going to go back and say your life. You need to put your life behind Christ. It could come to that. And that's what they're talking about here with the king going to war. So he's coming to the followers and saying, listen to me, I've ratcheted up. Now this is the apex. This is life. You may have to give up your life. Are you interested? If not, turn back now. So it's going to take everything we have, everything we think we have, and more. The demands are going to be significant. Is it doable? Yes. Are we here? Yes. Are we managing? Yes. Do we have problems? Yes. But we have momentum. But we've got to build the momentum first. I have uh, been very interested over the past few years listening to some people outside the church. There's one group that says if you become a Christian, you're going to become a millionaire. So everybody joins in. And of course, they find out they don't get any richer than they were, and they drop out of the church. But during that time, they have a significant amount of growth and a lot of money coming into the coffers. Or you have the individual saying, you're going to have perfect health once you become a member of the church. And then they get in, they have problems, and they fall away. No, this is not what he's saying. What he's saying is, you're going to have issues. But the prize afterward is worth more than anything else that you have. So the will of God needs to be the priority here, even if it means our life or our physical health. Again. Same as we had the last two questions. In this parable, he's coming back the third time and saying, if you can't do that, don't start. Leave now. But in this case, it's a king in battle. We don't have a lot of battles around us. At that time, they had battles 
in the springtime almost every year. And so the kings would come in, they'd wage war against other people, and a lot of people would die. And then next thing it would be a turmoil because a lot of the individuals that were working in the fields are doing the things that kept the community alive were no longer alive. There was a significant impact upon the structure of the community because these wars are happening all the time on a yearly basis. So what he's saying is, what's important for you and where you're going to put your resources and what the end product is going to be? That's about the king. So in other words, if you don't have enough, the 10,000 to whip the 20,000, sue for peace. Because otherwise, you're going to be destroyed. And we saw that with the Assyrian coming in and taking over. They changed everything. And when the Babylonians came in and took over the southern tribes, they changed everything on purpose. This is a complete reversal of what the community was before. So halfway measures, lukewarm, is not going to apply. Keeps hammering that point all the way through. So let's get to, and there I talked about his about Laodicea and his comment there that I will spew you out of my mouth, vomiting you out of the mouth being lukewarm. So that's a context here with the king. Now I want to get into the area that we have the most controversy, and I've heard it in classes and preachers talking about it. And I, So I'm going to deal with the theological community as a whole and kind of bring that to you. Uh, first of all, I've got to have this one. I'm going to talk a little bit about it uh, just a moment ago with Gary. So Jesus made several calls to individuals. First one in Luke we have here, remember that that's when Jesus came to the Sea of Galilee, that Simon and his brother and his, uh, Simon's uh, employees had been out fishing all night, came in, they had not caught anything. You can imagine how tired they were. Here's a guy walking along the beach saying, I want to get in your boat, and I want you to row out a little bit, because I want to talk to all these people who are following me, and Simon allows Jesus in the boat. Jesus presents a lesson to them about who he was and what the focus of his ministry, and then he comes in, and on the way in, as they're rowing in, he turns to them and says, follow me. Here it is, Luke 5, 11. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed him. What did they leave? They, leave? they left a whole boat full of fish. They've been out all night. Jesus put so much fish in the boat, they almost sank. What is the livelihood of Simon's family? Fishing. That's all gone. He's walking away from all of that. He's walking away from family. He's walking away from a fortune of fish, all for something he didn't really know about, but he was captured by the thought. He left. They all left everything and walked away. Now, I've got the other ones, uh, Luke 5, 27 through 28. We're not going to look at that. I've left it in your notes if you want to look at that later. But let's look at another one. This is the one that didn't turn out well. The other one was about Lazarus. Here is a young ruler that comes to Jesus. Jesus knows he's very rich. And so he asks Jesus, I've done everything for the law, so what am I missing? Jesus looked at him and loved him. This is different from that hate we talked about just a moment ago. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. Did he follow him? No. Categorically, at this, the man's face fell. He went away because he had great wealth. So not everyone that was called went, but they made a decision either to go or to stay. This is the one that I want to get to here. We'll see how much time I can put on this. Here's the salt. And Steve covered that a couple weeks ago, and I told him afterward, I thought he did a great job. If we take it literally, it doesn't make sense. I'm going to take the literal side of this and show you that it doesn't make sense, and let's see if I can give you some stability with the figurative. Salt was extremely important. In fact, they had salt wars. The last salt war in the United States was fought from 1866 to 1878. Twelve years. People fought, fought over salt. That was the last war we had in the United States on the salt. So it's used for flavoring and preservation, which Steve covered. There's another aspect of salt we're going to look at here from the literal side, the chemical side. So in that day, salt was so important for them, it was an essential of life, very highly sought after. We now go to the store, we can buy salt anywhere, and it's not very expensive, although some of the gourmet salts are very expensive. 
Now, one of the things that we have to look at is that pure salt is white. Not all salt you have on your table is pure salt. So let's look at the definition, because not all salts are the same. Salt is defined as any chemical compound formed from the reaction of an acid and a base, where a metal comes in and takes off the hydroxyl and becomes part of the process. So we look at it here. This is what sodium chloride looks like. That's a fingerprint. Sodium is on your left-hand side, and the chloride is on the right. We have positive and negative. The bond is very strong, but it can be dissolved. So let's look at it and say, are all salts the same? The answer is categorically not. When we use the term salt in this, it's only sodium chloride. It's not anything else, just only sodium chloride. It's only a family of salts. There are hundreds of salts around. Some are benign, such as sodium chloride. Some are not. You do not want arsenic or cyanide in your water. They're salts. So some salts can be a benefit for you. Some salts can kill you. So we've got, in this point, to take all the other salts away and say only sodium chloride. Now, table salts. There are 12 different types of table salts you can buy. There are 12 different colors. White is the pure gray. Black is from Hawaii, black salt. How many of you have Himalayan or Peruvian salt? The pink kinds. The reason why it's pink is the bacteria that's in it. They don't like to put that out in public because you get kind of nervous going, what bacteria? That's bad. Bacteria here is benign, but that's what colors. When Brian was talking last week and said yellow is his favorite color. There's a yellow table salt, beautiful color of yellow. It's sodium ferrocyanide. cyanide. That last part, not very appetizing for us, but yet it's table salt. You can buy it from the store. It's about $10 a pound. Very expensive in comparison, but it's a table salt. Remember, we're only dealing with sodium chloride. So let's look at it from a standpoint. Are they the same? Is every hue of blue the same? That would be the same statement. Now, look at this. You can go from cyanide, which is a turquoise, to almost a black in there. The whole range is of the hue of blue is not the same. All salts are not the same either. Just like we could say here, the not every hue is a Dickinson. I just had to, you know, I just had to. So here, let's look at it. Here's one of the statements I got from the theologian and theologians in, the, in this research. It is possible, that means categorical, for all the sodium chloride to be leached out or dissolved out of a mixture of salt so it's left as stale and tasteless, useless. By the way, all salts are soluble in water. They all move together. When you leach one out, you leach many of the others out. But let's look at this. So when we dissolve salt, we put salt in hot water. We want to get the pot boiling so that we can put potatoes in to do mashed potatoes. What happens to the salt? Well, the salt is pulled apart because the oxygen is negative. It pulls the sodium apart, and the two electrons that are positive pull the chlorine apart. So we would think that that being dissolved, that they're cleaved. What happens at the end? Well, we see at the end that if we let it dry, what happens at the bottom? The salt comes back because when the water is gone, the salt comes back. We don't dissolve being taken away. Yes, some of it goes into the food, but not everything. Salt is not cleaved. I've got a lot more material here, so let me go real fast in it. When we take sodium chloride and take it apart, the only way to do that is through electrolysis, the chloroalkylase process or something else. Last time I looked, they did not have that in Jesus' day. So categorically, it was something that we have today that they were not dealing with back then. The salts can all be leached out because they're all being dissolved within the water. They all don't come out at the same time. We'd have to use electrolysis to get them out. Bottom line is, the salt is what? Figurative. It's not salt. I've got more information. There's some there for you that you can look at as well. Um, but anyway, I know we're running out of time. So let me go close. You can catch me afterward if you want a little bit more information. So let's go with a prayer. And dear Father, the message that you give and the parables are so strong. They apply today, even though it's 2,000 years ago. 
They give us insight as to what you're talking about here with your ministry. Father, help us to not be lukewarm. Help us to find that momentum and stay with the momentum and find out where we're going and look to you only. Thank you so very much for the time. Be with us. Let us put our thoughts away and be ready for the ministry that we have coming later. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.